Well, thank you very much, John, for your very kind words of introduction. It's just such a great honor uh, to have been invited here. I'm so touched in seeing all of you uh, coming here for this uh, conference to think about a theme which is so great and so central without which the church would not exist. For the last uh, decade or so, uh, I've been uh, thinking uh, about the world in which we live and trying as best I could uh, to try to understand it. And as vital and important as it is to do that, uh, to understand ourselves and our own internal processes, I can tell you that coming here tonight to speak about the supremacy of Christ uh, is just such a great joy and, I might even say, relief. So it falls to me to open up this conference, and what this might mean is that I am going to tread step on the territory of the speakers who are going to come after me. But since I go first, <laughs> that's their problem. <laughs> so I am without sympathy for them. So what I want to try to do uh, in this first uh, evening, I realize that uh, Many of you have traveled from far away and perhaps have time differences, and so I want to try to speak uh, as uh, simply and straightforwardly as I can uh, on the subject of the supremacy uh, of Christ. Now, in 1793, uh, when William Carey went off to India to preach the gospel, 98% of Protestants lived in the West. After that, we had a century of missions. At the beginning of the 20th century, after that century of missions, it was still 90% of Protestants lived in the West. And so perhaps somebody might have been forgiven if they thought that Christianity was a European thing, or that it was a Western thing, or that it was a white man's thing, or if you were in China, that it was the thing of the foreign devils. But no longer. Uh, tonight, we live at a time, one of the times of great transformation in Christian faith. Not a transformation in its nature, because it does not change any more than God can change, but a transformation in where it is believed, where Christian believers are found. And when we look at the globe, uh, we see a pattern emerging. Christianity is moving south, into Latin America and Africa, and it is moving east, and moving east into some of the most populous nations in Asia. Tonight, there are probably more Christians in China than there are in the United States. And even in India, Christian faith is growing. In the West, statistically speaking, Christianity is struggling to survive. The United States is a bit of an exception. But in Europe, vast areas of its life have been simply stripped of all Christian presence, leaving behind nothing except empty churches and empty cathedrals. This is somewhat true of Canada. It's true of Australia. It's true of New Zealand. This coming Sunday, only 
of people in New Zealand will even go to a church. Now, by contrast, uh, just a few months ago, I was in Africa. I was in Zambia and Malawi and Kenya. And in those countries, on a given Sunday, about 80% of people go to church. Well, when I say they go to church, some of them meet under a tree or beside a building. But you get the point. The fact is that today there is more Christian believing outside the West than there is inside the West. Christianity is becoming de-Westernized. And I have no idea how you're going to sign that word. (laughs) De-Westernized. But I'm sure you're very good at what you're doing. (laughs) So what is this faith of ours? Well, it is the faith of those from every people group, just about on the face of the earth, who own and acknowledge and worship Christ as supreme. Now, in this regard, it is very different from Islam. Islam has a geographical center in Saudi Arabia, and in particular, Mecca, to which all Muslims point when they're praying. It has a language. No matter what a person's language is, every Muslim is called to prayer in Arabic. And devout Muslims do not believe that the Quran can be translated. But Christian faith has no geographical center. There is not one race that dominates it. There is not a preferred language for its expression. And there is no privileged culture for its home. There's no place, no race, no tongue or culture, which is the center that holds it all together. No, it is a person, and not just the founder of a religion, but the incarnate, resurrected, and reigning Christ, whose death is the only ground for our forgiveness, and whose resurrection inaugurated that reign that is going to cleanse the entire universe of evil. Now, the world has known some great people. We speak about uh, Charles the Great, Charlemagne, Alexander the Great. Some speak of Pope Leo the Great. We might say that Winston Churchill was a great man. But Jesus Christ is not great. He is incomparable. He is in a category all of his own. He is unique. Of who else can you say that he was God incarnate, that he bore our sin in our place, that he rose from death, and that he now reigns supreme? You cannot say that of anybody else. Now, the book in the New Testament which argues this case most uh, insistently, uh, is the book of Hebrews. And so what I want to do uh, in the time that I have is, first of all, uh, to give a little brief introduction. I'm only going to give one case, case study, one instance of the kind of argument that we find in the first ten chapters And then I want to focus a little bit of attention on the 11th chapter. There is a truth there that we need to grasp as we come to think more specifically about the supremacy of Christ for ourselves. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that introduction. And then secondly, I want to put two texts side by side that come from this argument of the first ten chapters. 
The first text is in uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which gives us this uh, rather extraordinary picture uh, of Christ inaugurating his rule over life that is cosmic in its dimension, putting the whole of creation back to its purpose. And then the second text is from Hebrews chapter 10, which presents us with Christ seated and all of his enemies conquered and under his feet. Now, these two texts serve as a kind of um, framework for us to think about the supremacy of Christ. So, first, let me give you just this brief little introduction. Now, all I can do here, given our time, uh, is to try to remind you uh, of the kind of argument uh, that goes on in these first ten chapters. It's a letter, of course, that was written to Jewish believers, uh, tempted to fade back into the woodwork. These were Jews uh, who'd been brought up to treasure everything that God had done in their history. They had been the recipients of God's oracles. To them, he had sent prophets. And prophets are usually more fondly remembered after their death. And to them, he had given extraordinary leaders like Moses. And in their history had come these miraculous deliverances. They treasured all of these things, and it was part of their identity. But now they faced a very unhappy situation. Persecution was breaking out. Roman power was looming up in opposition. They were being hounded by religious authorities. There was danger all around, fear within, and so they were inclined simply to disappear, to go back into the relative safety of the Judaism from which they had come. But in order to go back, they had to pass by the uniqueness of who Christ is and what he has done. And so, in this letter, again and again, this contrast is made between what we have in the Old Testament and what we have in Christ. Now, I can only give you just one illustration of that, and it comes in chapter 1, and you've already heard it in a prayer tonight. Look what the writer says. Long ago, this is verse 1, long ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So there is continuity here. God spoke to our fathers, and it is the same God who has now spoken to us through his Son. So there is not a radical total breach. There is continuity. It is the same God who is speaking. But, of course, along with this continuity comes this contrast. He spoke in the past, but in his Son he has spoken to us. He spoke in the past to our fathers, here a little, there a little, in this way, in that way, some revelation given to Moses, some to David, some to Isaiah, but none given to any one of them. But now, in these last days, at the end of this run, has come His Son. God in the flesh something never seen before, something absolutely unique, the one in whom are hidden, are contained, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
Now these prophets, these great prophets, even in their greatness, were just messengers. He is the end game message. He is the one who brings into a final, full, complete, and absolute synthesis all that God has been saying across the ages. And who else could we put in this category? The author then goes on to give us uh, probably the most compact and extraordinary uh, summary of the person and work of Christ. So who is he? Well, in verse 3, he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, that he possesses all of the attributes, all of the perfections of God, of his nature and of his glory. All of the undiminished godness of God was his, so that even during his life, he could say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That is who he is. Now look how the author speaks of what he has done. So what has he done? In verse 2, through whom he made the universe. So you can just tick these things off. Creation, through whom he made the universe. Eschatology. He is appointed the heir of all things. Providence, in verse 3, having created all things, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Salvation, in verse 3, he made purification for our sins. Fifthly, the resurrection is implied, though not stated. And finally, the ascension in verse 3. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Creation, eschatology, providence, his work on the cross, resurrection, ascension. Certainly, the angels couldn't even be put in this category, and that is the argument for the rest of chapter 1. So why then, the author asks at the beginning of chapter 2, why then are these Jewish believers drifting away from this unique person, unique in his person and unique in his work? Why would they leave what is unique for what is not? What is completed for what is not? What is completely glorious for what is less so. Why would they do that? This is something uh, that I just want you to note because I'm going to come back to this in a second. But so this argument goes through the first 10 chapters. In chapter 1, he's superior to the angels. In chapter 3, he was superior to Moses. In chapter 4 through 10, in his sacrifice and his priestly work, he is supreme and finalizes and brings to completion all that we have seen in the Old Testament. And then in chapter 11 comes the pastoral application of all of this. There have been little applications along the way, but here comes the really big one. And chapter 11 is such a magnificent chapter with its many thumbnail sketches and portraits of Old Testament figures and their extraordinary faith, that in our minds it tends to be a standalone section of Scripture. And we oftentimes don't see its connection uh, with what has gone before. But for the author of this epistle, uh, there is a clear parallel happening here between God's Old Testament people and their meanderings in unbelief and the people to whom he is writing, these Jewish believers who are thinking of fading back into the woodwork and leaving Christ. There clearly is in the author's mind a parallel here. So what was the problem with the Old Testament people of God? 
Well, he identifies it for us in chapter 3 and verse 19. He says that we see that they were unable to enter the promised land because of unbelief. They couldn't enter because of unbelief. They came to the very edge of what God had promised them, and they just decided it was too risky to enter. Whoever was there was bigger, nastier, and more numerous than they were. They couldn't cope with what was there, and so they shrank back. They retreated. In their own minds, they somehow could not see that God would be sufficient for them in this time of uh, engagement with what was on the other side. In their imaginations, they saw giants and they saw cities that were impregnable and fortified, far greater than what they could count upon by way of God's deliverance. Now, this is the very problem that's happening again, confronted by these, this hostile Roman world and these hostile Jewish leaders, these Christians are now filled with uncertainty, and they're shrinking back, they're pulling back from Christ. What if they were put out of the temple? Would they not lose everything that was precious to them? And how would God be able to sustain them if that happened? And what if they were ejected from Judaism, which in fact happened? Would they not be cut off from Moses and David and Isaiah? In this 11th chapter, the author says, look, if you walk by faith, understand subtext, whether or not you're in the temple or in Judaism. If you walk by faith, you will be in continuity with all of the great leaders of the past. You will lose nothing because what they all had in common, whether they were kings or prophets or very simple people or martyrs, what they all had in common is what he mentions in chapter 11 and verse 1. This assurance of things hoped for and this conviction of things not seen. This confident, almost fearless persuasion of what was there, of what was there in the goodness of God, in His, in his character, in His greatness, this persuasion that that was there. They didn't actually see it, but it wasn't naive to believe it. No, in a sense they saw it with their inward eyes. They trusted it. They acted upon it. These were people of faith, people of this inward persuasion. And this is what makes hearts strong in bearing suffering. And it's what enabled them to bear sickening disappointments sometimes and terrible reverses and sometimes disheartening unfaithfulness and sometimes very harsh treatment. Look at these verses at the end of the chapter in uh, verse uh, 35 second part of that verse, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. And they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. 
This is remote from our experience here in the West, but we need to understand that today, even in other parts of the world, these words here describe what is happening. When I was in Nigeria last, I went to one of our orphanages that Rafiki runs, and uh, one of the missionaries there pointed out five little kids who are in the orphanage. Uh, they are there uh, because uh, not too long ago uh, they were attending church with their parents, and the Muslims were waiting for them when they came out, and there was a great slaughter. These little kids were left without either parents. So this is one side of this walk of faith. But you notice what else he says. And here, here is the other side, and it is in verse 33. These people, these people of faith who conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. The reason these Jewish believers were drawing back from Christ came down to a matter of faith. It came down to a matter of, of this in, invincible persuasion that in this moment had weakened. It always comes down to a matter of faith. For these young believers, these Jewish believers, their vision of Christ, their understanding of Him uh, had been clouded out of concerns for their personal safety. They didn't know what would happen to them. They didn't know what abuse would come their way. And so they thought it was better to be safe than to be sorry. We don't worry about these things here in the West. But our problem, I think, is at a slightly different point. It's not so much fear for our safety as it is that we are so distracted by so many things that it is hard for us to sustain this focus upon the supremacy of Christ in our world and our lives. We think of our experience here in the West in terms of its enormous benefits, as indeed we should. In the year 1900, the average life expectancy was only 49 years. And today, it's uh, a little bit over 80. So we have almost twice as much life to live. And isn't that a benefit? So it goes for almost everything else. We know more, communicate more, communicate faster. We travel more, travel more often, travel further. What we buy is of higher and higher quality. We have more and more of it. We have freedoms. We have opportunities that previous generations never had. But along with these undoubted benefits for which we're all grateful, along with these come costs. And the costs are very often hidden. They're like shadows that come right behind these benefits. It's not easy living in this fast-paced, modernized world of ours, so highly competitive, this world where products come on the market and off it in a flash, where job insecurity is a condition of life, where anxiety stalks our lives all the time, where our connections with anything outside of ourselves are very tenuous, where many families are scattered to the four winds, where we ourselves move and travel and flit about, not rooted 
in a place. What strikes me as I travel between the first and third worlds is that at least uh, in Africa, what is most pressing to people are physical needs. The need for food. Many go from day to day and many do not have three meals. For security, many live in tumultuous social conditions. And the need for care, very simple medical care. I heard some children singing a little praise chorus I don't remember it all, but I remember the lines, He butters my bread. He sugars my tea. He pays my school fees. Now, I don't think that you and I worry that much about whether we will have bread and sugar and certainly school fees of this order. For us, our challenge is somewhere else, and it is more psychological. It's the psychological pressure of living in this highly compressed, pressurized, and relativistic society of ours, where worldviews and lifestyles and religions jostle together shoulder by shoulder and rub off the edges and make Christian faith hard to sustain. It's the intrusiveness of this world into our very innermost workings. So much fills our mind. So much, so much that is urgent. So much that is now. So much that demands our attention. Now. And our preoccupations are with surviving and they are with the intensity of the moment. This is what people bring with them into church every Sunday. This is why they want sermons on how to control anxiety and how to get on with your mother-in-law. And these needs are undoubtedly real. They really do feel these things in themselves. But sermons that are only addressing those matters are exercises in futility if the centrality and the sufficiency and the supremacy of Christ has been lost. In an entirely different way, we oftentimes in our churches seem to be shrinking back from Christ. I'm going to pick this up again in a second. But let us remember that this faith, this faith, this this persuasion of the uniqueness and centrality and greatness of Christ, this is the faith, our author tells us, that conquers kingdoms, enforces justice, and obtains promises. It's what enables us to live with suffering and with sickening disappointments and sometimes harsh reverses. So all of that is by way of introduction. (laughs) But it was a long introduction. Now secondly, let me come to the supremacy of Christ itself. And I want to put together uh, for you Uh, to think uh, of two texts uh, side by side. Uh, The first comes from chapter 2, and it is um, verses uh, 8 and 9, which I will read. Uh, Verse 8 is just quoting uh, a psalm, speaking of the creation. You've crowned human beings with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet, Now, I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control. At present, however, we do not see everything in subjection to him. But we see him, Christ, who was for a little while made lower than the angels, and so on. So that is the first text. 
And the second uh, that I'll read in, in a moment comes from chapter 10. I'll come back to that. Now, these two verses have behind them two psalms. Uh, behind chapter 2 uh, is Psalm 8. And it is a psalm that itself looks back to the cultural mandate of Genesis 1, 28. This mandate given to us to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. To have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and everything else that moves. This mandate has never been rescinded, despite the fall. The problem is that creation itself, even creation, has been derailed. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 8. He says that the whole of creation is subject to futility. That is to say, it's not able to reach the purpose for which it was created. And we experience this futility and this derailment. Instead of having dominion over creation, we are often its victims. There are predators. As Martin Luther Riley noted, that if the lion and the lamb lie down together now, you'll have to keep replacing that lamb. And there are poisonous snakes, and there are viruses, and we think of HIV that is wiping out millions, and our harvests upon which we depend sometimes are withered by a sun which is too hot, or ruined by too much rain, or rain coming at the wrong time. No, at present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. And when we look inside ourselves as human beings, we do not see everything in subjection to, that, to us either. Uh, despite decades of the self-help movement and a century of psychology, we still do not have ourselves under control. The truth of the matter is life falls apart we actually experience it as ambiguous. There's almost two sides to it all the time. On the one hand, God has written meaning into it. On the other hand, because of sin, we experience it as frustrating. The Internet, for example is an extraordinary tool for the conquest of space, transferring information around the globe almost instantaneously. And we thank God for this tool by which we can communicate to our missionaries. But the Internet is where predators stalk young girls. That kind of two-sidedness we see almost everywhere in life. We don't have the world outside of us under control. We don't have the world inside us under control. But we see Jesus, verse 9, who by the grace of God tasted death for us. He tasted death for us, dying in our place, the just for the unjust, bearing the righteous anger of God. This is the theme that's explored all through the New Testament, as we know. I here just give you a few selected uh, comments from Martin Luther from his commentary on Galatians, summing up this work of Christ he says, if Christ himself was made guilty of all the sins which we all have committed, then we were absolved from all sins, yet not through ourselves, our own works, or merits, but through him.
for him to overcome the world's sin, death, and God's wrath. This is not the work of any created being. It is the work of Almighty God. And then again, for against these so mighty powers, sin, death, and the curse, which of themselves have dominion in the world and all creation, another and a higher power must appear, which can be none other than God himself. And so it was. He tasted death for us. And so begins this great work of re-railing creation. It's been derailed. It's going to be re-railed. The work of Christ is not limited simply to our souls. We're grateful that he is our Savior and our Lord and need to confess that. But the reach of Christ's conquest is cosmic. It is right through the whole universe. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, my second text that I want to put alongside this comes from chapter 10. Chapter 10 and verses uh, 11 through uh, 13. Verse 11, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. There are two points that we need to notice here. First of all, the contrast between the priests of the Old Testament is another example of this kind of argument. Uh, the point that he makes is that the priests were not allowed to sit. They were always standing because their work was never completed. But Christ sits because his work is done. It is completed for all time. It does not have to be re-offered, endlessly re-offered, either in heaven or here on earth in the Mass. No, he sat down, his work is finished. So it's a contrast between work that was not finished and that which is. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time. Now, the second point that is made here. Uh, is in the citation uh, in verse 13 from Psalm 110. The Psalm 8 was behind chapter 2, and it is Psalm 110, uh, which is uh, behind this section here. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made his footstool. Uh, the picture is clear. In that ancient world, when an enemy was conquered and disgraced, the conqueror would visibly represent that conquest by putting a foot on that person's neck or head. And Christ has his foot upon this defeated and disgraced enemy. That is the picture that we have from Psalm 110. Now this psalm and this verse uh, is cited about 20 times in the New Testament. The New Testament authors, led by the Holy Spirit, as they pondered and reflected upon the person of Christ, took this text and, and saw it as the framework within which they could think of Christ much as the prophet Isaiah was given to think about God in chapter 40 of Isaiah. If you remember that great chapter, you have the picture of God's sovereignty over everything, over all nations, over the whole universe, no matter how large it is. He rules over all. Now, that's the picture uh, that the New Testament has of Christ. 
But they use Psalm 110 verse 1 in particular uh, to paint this. But you notice what this author does. Instead of speaking simply about Christ's sovereignty, he speaks about the sovereignty in terms of Christ's enemies. Christ, Christ's rule, as it were, emerges from the ashes of the defeat of the powers of darkness. So it is in that uh, psalm, uh, you have verse 1 cited here. In verse 4 of that psalm, you have the reference to priesthood. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It is Christ's priestly work by which his sovereignty, his conquest, is secured over all evil. And this is the, the triumphant, this, the, the glorious note that we hear from one end of the New Testament to the other. Christ has been elevated, Ephesians 1 Christ has been elevated far, far above all rule and authority and dominion and every name which is named. 1 Peter 3.22, Christ is now at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. The New Testament authors ransack their vocabulary to come up with every conceivable way of saying it. He has conquered all powers, rulers, authorities, spiritual forces in height or in depth, and death itself. It was the holiness of God that called for his death. It is the grace of God that provided his son in dying. And here... In the tasting of death, chapter 2, verse 9, by which this conquest is effected in chapter 10, by this tasting of death, in this moment, we see the spontaneous, outgoing, uncalculating love of God reaching out for sinners. God loving the unlovely, giving himself to those who would not give of themselves to him, forgiving those for whom there is no ground for forgiveness unless God himself provide it. And in this moment, in Christ's death and conquest over death at the cross, the very back of evil is broken. We might think of it very simply in terms of a chess game in which two players are fighting it out with each other, and the game reaches a point at which one of the players pulls back from the table and says it's over. And perhaps the other player says, no, it's not. I still have a number of moves to make, potentially. And the first player says, it doesn't matter what you do, because every single move you make will end in the same conclusion. The game is locked up. And so it was at the cross. This game has been locked up. The outcome cannot be changed. What we are seeing now is the last futile moves of the enemy, not one of which is going to change the outcome that happened at Calvary. And so tonight, we celebrate together this marvelous truth of Christ's supremacy in our world and in our universe. Now, I want to draw three conclusions from this. I have three points. And the first is this, that Christianity is only 
about this kind of Christ. Christ reigning supreme and unchallenged and unchallengeable over all of life's enemies. We do not have any other message than this. Now, if seekers and postmoderns don't want to hear this, the bottom line is that we don't actually have anything else to give them. Our only message is of Christ as unique, central, indispensable, and supreme. Now, we do need to talk together, and I am very anxious to hear my fellow speakers uh, talking about this. We do need to talk together and think together about how we do uh, help people to come from where they are in our postmodern culture to this point of seeing Christ as central, sufficient, and supreme. But at the end of the day, we do not have a different Christ for the postmodern generation than any other generation. Now, during the 1980s and 1990s, some of our churches concluded that the kinds of things I have been saying uh, would have been very off-putting to postmoderns. So in order to appeal to the market, they began to offer a kind of slimmed down version of the gospel. It's not that cardinal truths were usually denied. It was just more that they were concealed. They were hidden. They were kept out of view. Thinking that these would be an impediment to the church's success. Two decades later, we're now living with the consequences of this. In America today, 45% of people say that they are born again. Only 9% have even the slightest clue about the most minimal biblical understanding or what it means to live an ethical life as a disciple. 45% say they're born again. Only 9% have a clue as to what that might mean. In America today, being born again counts for nothing. I believe that the chickens have come home to roost. And am, am I correct in thinking that we are not far from the very difficulties that the author identifies in these Hebrew Christians. We are shrinking back from this full-orbed biblical understanding of the uniqueness of Christ and his centrality. They did it out of fear for their safety. We're doing it out of fears that we will not be successful. Now, aside from any other consideration, I think this is a serious miscalculation. I was interested to read not long ago Tom Rayner's book called Surprising Insights from the Unchurched and proven ways to reach them. Not so sure about that last bit, but anyway. He makes a very interesting observation that all of this market research that was done during the 1980s and 1990s was trying to test what would be tolerable to seekers in our society, what they would what they would be willing to go along with, what they didn't like, what they wouldn't put up with. And the point he makes is that the customer who was being analyzed in this way remained almost entirely outside of the churches. The customer who was in view in this market research 
in many cases, never even came into a church. It would be much better, he said, to look at the formerly church, that is to say, people who never used to go to church and who were unregenerate, and then, for whatever reason, came to church. Ask them why they came to church. And what do we find out? Well, it's really rather interesting that 90% say they come to church for its preaching. And 88% say they came to hear its doctrine. Can you believe that? (laughs) They actually want to know whether we believe anything. (laughs) And they want to know what it is. So why are we shrinking from telling them? But again, even if this weren't so, the only Christ we have to preach is the one the New Testament gives us. And our message is not just about Jesus. It's about Jesus, God incarnate, who bore our sins in our place, who rose in conquest over death, and who broke the back of evil and will one day restore the whole cosmos. That is the Christ who is at the center of our faith. And we cannot shrink from this. Now, let me make a second point. And my points are going to get briefer and briefer. (laughs) We today uh, live in this period between the already and the not yet. We have been redeemed in full, for there is nothing that needs to be added to what Christ did. There is nothing that can be added, and there is nothing that can be taken from what he did. We have been redeemed in full. But you and I know ourselves not yet to be fully redeemed. We live, in other words, between... Hebrews 10.13, Hebrews 10.13, that he sat down waiting from that time until his enemies should be destroyed. We live between that moment and what Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24 at the very end of time uh, where he says at the end, when Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. We might, if I can revert to my simple little illustration, we might say, we're living in this period between the time when the outcome to the chess game has been decided and the moment when the last futile move is made. And we live in a fallen world full of painful complexities and sometimes the most jarring brutalities. The great Puritan preacher Richard Baxter observed, and I'm here quoting him, that we are vexed with unsatisfied desires, with troubled passions, with other tormenting pains, with languishing weakness and enemies' malice, with poverty and care, with losses and crosses, and shame and grief, with hard labor and studies, with injuries and spectacles of a chaotic world, and with fears of death and death at last. Now, this is all true, and perhaps it is especially true in this highly pressurized and and difficult world in which we live. But it is not the only truth, as Baxter knew. It is not the complete truth. There is another, another side to it. But these painful experiences that we go through, that catch our attention, that, that sometimes consume us, that, that just so preoccupy us, that so focus us, None of these 
is the final word. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us, Paul says. And not even death is the last and final word. O oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. So let us put our perplexities, uh, let us put them in this, in this bigger context, remembering the supremacy of Christ, remembering that we move between the already and the not yet, remembering that God, our Heavenly Father, is taking us by the hand and leading us to that place. And then finally, let me just observe that it is God's pleasure that His Son should be acknowledged now for who He is. And in worshiping Him for His supremacy, we are simply anticipating that moment at the end of time when every knee will bow. God takes pleasure in what we're doing now. For we who were His enemies have been reconciled. We who were far off have been brought near. And we who were blind now see. And now we come in awe and gratitude, acknowledging Christ for who He is, to the delight of God our Heavenly Father. And in so doing, we find that we have simply been returned to the purpose for which we were first created. Amen. Thank you.